first of all, uh, I am Duncan. Um, I'm a university I'm a student at the University of Edinburgh, and I live in Glasgow. Um, also, um, I believe hello to Olivia, uh, who are currently watching the live stream, who is in Olivia, uh, and are tweeting all of everyone's uh, slides in uh, Spanish. So that's quite cool. Um, yeah, I'm Duncan Bain. I'm a entry-level researcher in architecture at the University of Edinburgh, um, and I'm just broadly speaking, I research uh, how open source and, uh, open knowledge and, and things that are termed open have an application uh, within the field of architecture, uh, particularly architectural design, um, and how it, it's social research. So I'm interested in communities that come together to create peer-to-peer -peer or open technologies and how that might work within the field of architecture. And this presentation is specifically about a project that I've been working on um, that's got me in touch with people within the OSM community um, to develop 3D building information within the Gorbals in Glasgow. Um, so that's a brief overview of uh, how the, the, the presentation will be structured, but we'll go for it. That makes some sense. Um, so the project I was involved in um, was initiated by MATLAB in Glasgow, and I don't know if many of you know MATLAB. It's a um, what called it's called a fab lab or a maker space. Um, it's uh, part of the Lighthouse, uh, which is Scotland's architecture and uh, design centre, uh, and they have uh, they have uh, um, one of their gallery spaces has been turned into a fabrication space, so it has 3D printers and laser printers and all sorts of crazy uh, newfangled technology that a lot of designers, jewelry makers, um, and increasingly people who are interested in, in the creating buildings are, are using to create some pretty nifty technology. And um, the guy who runs MATLAB, um, Bruce Newland, who's an architect by training, um, put out an advert on Facebook people who are interested in open source mapping and architecture and all, all things uh, open and kind. Um, and it was a, a, a wee meeting which was me, Bruce and Tim Foster, who I don't think is here today. Um, and Bruce was looking to develop a tool that would allow um, community asset mapping uh, and that would, would then feed into um, creating architectural materials that would be useful to uh, people who are interested in local community development. There's a, there's a uh, Glasgow uh, City Council initiative called Stall Spaces, where they have a pot of uh, funds available to uh, community groups who come forward with ideas to uh, take derelict uh, or <coughs> abandoned sites within the city and propose a temporary use for them while um, funding becomes available, <coughs> or until funding becomes available to do a, you know, a more full scale development. Uh, so he, the MATLAB plan at the, at the start of the project was to develop some tools that would, would enrich that process. Um, so yeah, that's, that's some images of MATLAB. Um, they have some cool 3D printers. They have a lot of um, mostly design and architecture graduates who come in and um, make things, uh, sort of freelance. Um, there's uh, some pretty cool things. Um, so the, the, the project started with uh, Mike Lug getting in touch with the Glasgow Housing Association who have a bit of funding to develop um, a model of the Gorbals, two models in fact. One of them would be for the Glasgow Housing Association office in the Gorbals and the other would be for a youth group called uh, the Glasgow Youth Cafe. So this is some members of the youth cafe who are all sort of um, late school age um, and, and uh, vomiting came along. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Bruce couldn't make it, so without um, being able to sort of start the project and got everyone in the room together, uh, uh, Bob largely ended up with sort of ad hoc and um, doing the whole presentation of what we're sent about and what we're sent to do for this project. Um, then there's a bit of, uh, a bit of mapping, so the idea was to, to create a model of the Gorbals, um, and to do that we needed, uh, the Gorbals is already quite well mapped. Parts of Glasgow, so we needed um, height information and, and, and the shapes of, of different buildings, uh, and you can tag all that stuff in OSM, and then the hope would be that that would provide the data to make the models out of. So there was a bit of time spent wandering around the models, taking photos of 
things, trying to figure out floor heights and stuff like that. Uh, before the data was taken back in to the lab, uh, into the night lab. Um, no, there's a there's a, a caveat to say that this would be an, uh, an OSN based model. Um, I think uh, not everyone who works within design or architecture are as um, rigorous on the, the open source side of um, of the, the, the you know the, the idea that if you're using an open source tool like OSN, that everything should remain open source. So a lot of this eventual model uh, used my OS data and stuff like that. So just for quick fixes, I came in one morning and the, the map laid out on the ground was a massive printout of, of an OS map, which we then used the, the, uh, the height data that we collected to sort of fill in. So this map's a bit of a fudge uh, of, of two different data sets, but because it's not, because it's real world and it's people putting stuff in bandsaws and, and um, Hacking at it with little uh, hand saws and stuff. It's not going to be that accurate to any data set anyway. So, um, so that's one of the models finished. It's huge. That's probably about two meters across. Two meters across. Um, and uh, as I say, all the height information is based on uh, of the street map. There's some bits which trip away. You might. Um, let, me, let me see. I'm just trying to remember where we are. There was, there was towers that were demolished during the making of this. I don't think anyone who wasn't dealing with open stream updates I did pick up on. I can't remember which ones. Are, are I remember them. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember these there. There's two at the top. Yeah. Uh, those were demolished midway through the process <laughs> of all this. So they got put in the model uh, in, in one day and then someone had glued them onto the base. So I think they're still there. Was it after the model was made that they were demolished? Um, was, it, was it after that? Okay, yes. we'll, we'll say that. <laughs> um, that's a closer up view of it. Um, there was a lot, you know, it was a really fun process. A few people from the Goblins Youth Cafe and the youth group came along to help us make it. Um, that tie up between the sort of community group and the people who initiated it wasn't as strong as perhaps it could have been. Um, but there was a lot of fun time spent sorry, bits of wood and stuff like that. Um, which, if you're into that sort of thing, so I'll, I'll go through the workflow a little bit because, you know, I'm not. I'm not as big on all of the OSM tech stuff as I'm sure most people are. So if I say any, anything completely heretical, I apologize. Um, so OSM tax is a very basic, um, basic information you can add to building um, polygons to give them a bit of um, three-dimensional data. So you've got building height, quite simply the height from the ground floor uh, up to the top of the roof. You can set that in meters. Uh, very simple, just takes the shape and extrudes it out of the way. Um, the building levels, if you don't know the exact height or you're, you're unwilling to make an educated guess, you can just see how many levels it is. And um, different ways of rendering that will then say, give an example, three meters per story height. Um, and when you can take it through to a rendering stage, it'll just say a four story building would be 12 meters tall. Um, roof height, you can set the height. The, the, Roof would be at. It takes the top height or your building height, subtracts down to where the eaves would sit, and you can add a roof shape tag, which gives it a sort of generic um, shape. Uh, so if you say roof shape, uh, gable, pits, mansards, um, any other uh, sort of roof, there's a whole wide variety of roof arrangements, and when you take that through into the rest <coughs> packages, I'll show you later, it automatically figures out. Uh, Sort of sensible geometry for that to work. You can see a lot more of the tags um, at that address. I'll put all these slides um, somewhere online later on. So this is adding tags to uh, buildings in uh, JSM, which I struggled to figure out how to use. Um, you can see this this the building here. It's, it's been given four levels, but it's also been given a height. I think it's all world, which I'll show you later. Um, first of all, if I see it, see it, it's a tag at height. No, it uses building levels, then looks at the, the, the roof shape and the, the uh, roof height to figure out a very basic geometry. There's a couple of cool tools to see this without having to take it through to a rendering stage. So, OSM Buildings.org will do a little sort of extruded thing where it shows you the, again, this is this a little, there's this buildings right there, they're gone now. Um, you know, you can see the, the shadows to give it a, a, a 
sort of relief. Um, and as you move around it, things are sort of um, sort of 2.5D style um, uh, parallax, parallax style thing. Um, so it gives it a bit of uh, depth. And you can also use ITO, ITO World's got a service which shows you what time information certain buildings have. So, you know, the process, the, the project I was involved in was doing a lot of mapping the models and everything around this wreck because it hasn't been given any sort of height information. So two buildings in Central Asia that some people have, have tagged, I'm not sure for what reason. Some places have incredibly high levels of, of, um, of detail with all these tags. The next stage is to take the OSM uh, data route to a program called OSM to World. You just Google the OSM to World, you can download this. Uh, it's, a, it's a Java program. Um, and it takes an OSM file and it transfers it into that, which is a really garish or colored, um, non aliased uh, output of, of that's the, the whole of the model. So it's relatively quick to process and this is not very um, visually appealing. This is uh, the People's Palace in Glasgow Green, which I think was, was that you, uh, Bob, put to an insane amount of detail uh, modeling with all its, uh, with all its curves and its, its big, uh, big glass uh, roof and stuff like that. Uh, so you can get a, a crazy amount of detail just from some simple tag information. And you can draw in lines to say where different roof lines um, fall. Um, Next slide, you can use OSM to World to export that data as a .obj file, which can be read on most um, CAD rendering uh, 3D packages, so SketchUp, Rhino, stuff like that. Um, and you can export that OBJ, uh, import that OBJ into SketchUp, which is what I use. It's the program that I'm most familiar with because it's quite intuitive. You need to do quite a lot of cleaning up of glitches and excess data which gets uh, exported in this process. And you end up with something that looks a bit like that. So that's a, um, that's a massive tile of most of the buildings that were 3D modeled in the Gorbals. Uh, and you can, you can fly around that. This has sketch up on it. I can sort of take you through and show you various bits and bobs. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, you can sort of render that in some, uh, some packages to get a, a bit more of a realistic look. That's another highly detailed bob model of uh, the Free Church on Gorbals Street. Um, you can see all the columns and stuff like that, it comes out looking really well, and that's just from tagging polygon shapes in, uh, in OpenStreetMap. There's, there's possibilities for, for adding actually the models that you're developing in 3D um, CAD programs. There are, there are some people who try to import them into, um, on, onto the, the, the website map so you can have even greater levels of detail. Um, my slide. From that CAD file, you can export it for 3D printing. And if I had, if I, I tried and was fairly unsuccessful at trying to get a look 3D printed model here today, uh, so apologies for that, it would have been quite cool to pass around. But if you want, uh, you can go to the Shapeways website uh, where I've uploaded that data. And for $15.23, you can buy all of the tiny little buildings with the Gorbals. And, uh, and the base, which costs $215. <laughs> um, you can probably make that a bit thinner. I, I think the way that Shapeways figures it out is um, a volume, a bit, a calculates volume of the shape and uh, makes it solid and uh, then charges you however much material that would, would cost to, to, to make. So there's probably ways you can, um, you can reduce that cost. Uh, I, tried, I tried really hard to combine those so you can buy the base and the as a one combined thing, but Shapeways wasn't really having well, there was glitches in the model and I have no idea why they existed. So if you do want to, you can go on and, and spend a reasonable bit of cash and buy all that and stick it together yourself. Uh, or I warn you, some of these would be fractions of a millimeter across because that's a yay size model. Um, so uh, I'm uh, the, the, the sort of the gist of the, the MacLab project, which ended up with a 3D uh, wooden model, uh, is a nice idea that communities could quite cheaply have a model of an area that they say uh, they, they want to display, they want to show off, that they, they want to use in developing some sort of proposal uh, for, for development. Uh, models can be a really um, 
invaluable in a way to explain design projects to the, to the public. So if, if you show the public a whole range of plans for a proposal, it, if you don't spend a lot of time looking at building plans, it's a bit off-putting. Uh, models can really, really quickly explain things. So I'm a big advocate of, of being able to develop models, and I think um, if you're, if you're a, a, a non-profit or a um, or a small local organization and you, you want a model, I think there's, there's an opportunity for a robot center to develop a tool. Robot center data to be used in the tool to create quick uh, fabricated models. So could this uh, concept be expanded? Uh, might every building on a send one data and might shape data? Certainly there's a lot of areas which are already quite mapped for that. Um, and could that data provide a tool which uh, community groups or, or, or uh, social enterprises and things could use to Develop architectural models. So this is um, this is Manhattan, um, and you can use maps of the same world or as certain certain areas are are rendered to show all the buildings uh, that are currently. So all of those red buildings that are flat are where the shape information for the building. All the ones with height are where obviously where the height information has been added as well. Uh, and the reason that's on New York is because quite a lot of the conversations which happened earlier in the day are about sort of, uh, reciprocal arrangement between an uh, official set of data and the community model, the community map set of data. So uh, the city of New York have just signed an agreement to uh, well, they pass a law, I think last year or two years ago, for it to make as much um, public data um, open as possible. Um, and uh, one of the things that they're doing is they're dumping a whole lot of uh, geographical information into OSM, uh, into OSM <coughs> which is uh, which they hope creates a sort of reciprocal system where people can uh, look at that data and fix it, and that will flag it up for uh, people who work for the city of New York, uh, and and will highlight perhaps areas where their own data sets are deficient. So it's quite interesting. More Donald, we were talking about um, the the difference between the OS street names and the um, the OSM street names, and uh, you you were saying you can look and see if, if you thought the OSM was wrong. I was interested if the Auckland survey people are sitting at computers on the other side of the system, going, hmm, I wonder if they're better at it than we are, uh, and if they're making edits to their data based on what OSM is telling them, which is what this system is sort of hinting at. Um, I think the answer to that is not not yet, but they're thinking about it. Good. Well, there's, you know, some, there's some talk of burial about that. Yeah, it's 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 debugging is what um, open uh, open uh, source software does all the time, and, and big companies work with individuals by releasing data that's full of bugs and letting them fix it. Um, and there's some sort of inter exciting technologies where big companies with big budgets are able to do stuff like uh, lidar. And using photography to auto generate models. So, this isn't photograph, this is Google Earth, uh, and it's insanely detailed. And presumably, you could pull that out and make a 3D model of that as well. So, there, there are questions about um, where data comes from, where, um, where you want to retain the, the, the community ethos that OSM has that obviously we think corporates don't have, but we can get good cool stuff like that. Um, and, and that reciprocal arrangement where, where data sets are. Um, are poured over by, by the public um, and, and there's a mutual improvement of, of public good data. Really good. Um, so what tools currently exist to explore these ideas? There's three different tools like these. Um, how can you develop data required in OSM? Should that data even be integrated into OSM? Like I'm sure there's a lot of people who say, oh God, three dimensions, that's just adding all their crazy stuff that we don't want to deal with. Um, and how can both open street maps and the benefit from that arrangement? So this is Terrafab. This is um, it's a, a service developed by Bangalore. I'm not sure the Bangalore are, but you can uh, you can download uh, terrain data from uh, the, the this open data that the Norwegian government or the Norwegian ma mapping organisation have released. Um, and you can go to this website that's listed above, and you can select an area of the map and it will upload it to Shapeways and you can buy it uh, and it will colour it and everything. So that's, uh, that's uh, a, fjord, a, a couple of fjords somewhere in Norway which you can buy a model of and eventually these things get uh, shipped to you and they look a bit like that. Um, 
So that's quite cool. Very cheap, cheap and easy way to get a terrain model. Um, and this, this is experiments I was sort of playing around with with uh, OS Open Data, so that's OS 350, which is run through SketchUp, and it's really unwieldy in, in stuff like SketchUp. You can get some quite nice terrain data, so that's um, the area around uh, Dunbar. Um, that's OS OS Open Data, that's every, uh, the Vector 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 Map District Data, that's every single building in the southwest of Scotland um, plotted that, so there's nothing else apart from buildings on that. So there's, there's, there's data sets there that you can do some pretty cool on stuff with. Terrainator is a service you can actually do the same in Britain. So it uses the OS, um, the OS um, uh, terrain data, the open terrain data, and you can download, uh, you can download the 3D model and then take it somewhere to get 3D printed. Um, so that's, that's really cool. Um, the, there's services already online which take open data and turn them into architectural models or, or terrain models. Um, and it would be cool if you could add building information to that so that you get a terrain model and uh, a little building sat in that terrain model and you've got yourself a little instant map of your, your home town. Um, there's a few different uh, online services which are hinting at ways that you might deliver that whilst, it, whilst keeping it uh, open source. So this is open desk. Um, so what OpenDesk do is they have a number of designers who design furniture which is all released using Creative Commons licenses and you can go to their website and just download that for free. However, if you don't want to then take it to, uh, to a workshop and make it yourself, you can uh, be put in touch with a fabricator who will do it for you and you can pay £600 and get a, a, a new table. But the data behind it all is completely open and free so you can do it yourself if you want to. Eventually, at some point, you're going to have to pay for the materials. So, whether or not you um, you want the fun challenge of making a table from scratch, or if you want someone else to do it for you, but it's cool that the design is free. You know, the knowledge is free. Um, so, can you streamline this whole process? Can that OS contour data or other three D data sources be incorporated, maybe not into OSM, because I'm sure there's massive challenges to do that, or can it be a sort of standalone service where we, we Create a website where you say, I want, to, I want to model of Glasgow, and you just put a rectangle of Glasgow, and then it um, takes you through to a, a, a range of different suppliers who might make that for you, or you can download the data and, and take it and do it yourself. Um, so there's, uh, there's technical challenges. How do you get more building footprints to sit on, on even uh, models? Um, and there's also a need for this to be quite simple because I think if you're going to offer if this, if the dream is to offer this to um, to people who otherwise wouldn't be engaged in getting uh, an, uh, an, an architectural or, or terrain model already, something as something as simple as the way the OSM website already works is uh, what you'd be aiming for. You can just go to the OSM website and say select an area and download the .osm file or download the PDF version or something like that. And can you do it? Can you make that system as simple as that? So I don't have to spend five hours waiting for my computer to turn a uh, .whole PJ file into a sketch file or whatever else. Um, there's a, my, my, um, my, my broader research interests are uh, about how architects and other design professionals, particularly architects, can, can use open open data, open knowledge to enrich their practices and vice versa, how those practices can feed back into the open movement. Um, so there's, there's, there's ways, there's questions about how open street maps might special serve um, the practices of architects, current architects don't have to engage with open street maps, I don't think they really understand what it is um, or why they would ever want to use it when you can just go on um, here's the, you know, you can just go on Grab an OS map, probably a bit illegally, and use it in your um, in your drawings. Um, so, is there any possibility of OSM ever existing at an architectural scale? That's you know getting insane the details. But all of that data exists out there somewhere. And once people have made maps everywhere that they want to, uh, the detail that it's currently at, people's fingers might get itchy, and maybe there's, maybe there's some further detail that might be explored at some point. But how can you ever achieve accuracy at that scale? Um, it's, it's, it's hard enough for professionals with professional tools going around to get it accurate enough for it to be sort of a, a legally binding document which uh, you won't, you won't get 
assume it, will, it turns out to be wrong. Um, and then, you know, where do you find that data? Does the data sets already exist in a way that can be licensed in, in an open manner, or do you need to collect that data? And if so, how do you go about doing it? Uh, and that's where our students would probably come in pretty useful. Uh, architecture students spend countless hours doing rubbish, wastes of time. Uh, that's, a, that's an enormous map I made in Berlin in my fourth year. It spent, I, it was countless hours of wonderful procrastination that, that I didn't meet. Uh, I didn't meet any of that detail, but it was fun to make. And, and if I'm going to spend all that time creating that, which then sits in a hard drive for the rest of my life, why not? have that data shared in some way. And obviously a lot of what that, what that model is derived from is licensed data which can put it to OSN. But if you start, if you start from OSN, you can, and you've got, you've got time to kill because you're, you're not actually wanting to do the work that you're supposed to do, <laughs> then, um, then why not feed it in and, and create, it all, create it all in an open way? And you know, most architecture students come out of school with Canvas, you know, 60, 60 people in a year will create the same set of drawings for a, a district of the time. Um, you know, the, the data is there in drips and drabs. If you start to collate that all, it's a possibility of an interesting service. Um, so this is more of a diagram that explains how I perceive of architects and our designers working in a sort of open commons framework. Um, a lot of it's about inputs and outputs. Uh, there's geographical data out there which exists in an open manner. There's CAD design data, which I'll sort of go on to in a second, um, that, that exists in an open manner. And, and you can take that in and then you process it, process it with using different tools. So there's CAD packages which are open source software rather than having to use lots of CAD, which costs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Fabrication technologies like 3D printers, which are open source, um, laser cutters, all stuff like that, which sort of feed into that process. And then the outputs of that are um, hopefully, if, if you were using something like open, open stream maps in your process, you'd be updating the data, so you'd be adding richness to that data set um, through your creative process. Uh, again, you might design a table, or you might design a building, and release it with a Creative Commons license, so then someone could go back to the top of that process, take your design, and, and sort of remix it, and do, do what they want with it. But on top of that, you're also producing something physical, you're producing architecture, so hopefully there's a there's a looping process here, which is also sort of spitting up tangents of real world buildings and stuff. Um, so when I talk about uh, architecture in an open source context, probably the best example is Wikihouse. Uh, and Wikihouse is a website where you can go to and download diagrams for how to create buildings, and then you can run them through CNC machines and knock them together. And in theory, it's very simple, but I'm trying to make one of these, and it's not as simple as all that. <laughs> um, so this is in MATLAB again. This is the team of MATLAB trying to make a uh, wiki house. And it took two days, uh, despite the website saying it should take one day. And um, it took a week to produce all of the material. You get massive sheets of plywood, which cost 100 quid each. You put it on a CNC machine, which has a little drill bit, and it sort of buzzes around. I'll show you a video in a second, it's quite cool. Um, and it sort of buzzes around and cuts out the shape and then you lift up the bed and then you just hammer it together and you're left with a little structure. And it's quite simple, but you know, it's a prototype, but it might turn into some, you know, their ambition is that you can create a house from scratch in a day just using um, digital fabrication tools. So there you go, that's, that's an overview. Uh, I went through the work project and a better workflow. If you want to ask me about the building types, I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon uh, and I'll be at the, uh, the hack event tomorrow. So